Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm late. Today's hearing uh, gives us an opportunity to take a big picture look at the effects of decades of federal energy tax policy on energy markets, prices, and most importantly, consumers. So I'm hopeful that our discussion today will help us develop a deeper understanding of the costs and benefits of driving energy policy through the tax code. I'd like to thank Chairman Upton, Congressman McNerney, and the other members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak on this important topic concerning federal tax policy and its effects on energy markets and consumers. When it comes to assessing tax policy, economists generally focus on the ways the tax code distorts behavior. There's a general presumption in favor of letting market prices guide the decisions of producers and consumers so that resources are allocated according to the underlying economic realities. When the tax code artificially steers behavior away from the market outcome, this makes society poorer. A textbook example of such harm is the distortions caused by an income tax. By artificially reducing the reward to earning wages, the income tax discourages work effort. On top of that, an income tax also leads individuals to save less because the income earned from saving is itself taxed. The income tax thus makes society poorer by both reducing work and reducing investment. Now, although economists disagree about the proper size of government, there's a general consensus that if the government is going to raise a target amount of revenue through a percentage tax, then the way to minimize the economic fallout is applying that tax on as wide a base as possible in order to keep the rate of the tax as low as possible. Now, to be sure, there's other goals of tax policy besides economic efficiency, but in terms of minimizing the distortion of behavior, the tax code would apply the same tax rate to all sectors of the economy and would contain no arbitrary deductions or credits that favor one group over another. Now, I should clarify that the principle here is no arbitrary deductions. I bring this up because some proposals for tax reform want to take away the deductibility of interest expenses, an option that currently gives companies an incentive to engage in debt finance relative to equity finance. But to me, it seems this has things backwards. After all, a company's interest payments really are expenses to the company. The real source of the distortion is the currently high corporate income tax rate of 35 percent. Lowering that rate would alleviate this particular distortion. Now, when it comes to energy markets, there are many provisions of the tax code that violate these general principles I've discussed. That is to say, the tax code currently has many provisions that are specifically designed to favor certain sectors of the energy market. Society ends up producing energy using more resources than it needs to because the tax code artificially hides the true cost of less efficient energy sources. The best example of such a distortion occurs in the electricity market, where there can be long stretches of negative wholesale prices. Wind operators will pay the grid to buy electricity from them with the price sometimes falling below minus 20 degrees per megawatt hour, sorry, 20, 20 dollars per megawatt hour. The reason for this strange occurrence is the generous production tax credit, which currently gives the owners of wind facilities a tax credit of $23 for every megawatt hour they produce. This can make it profitable at the individual level to sell wind power even at negative prices, but of course from the perspective of society as a whole, this is clearly a perverse outcome that would not occur on a normal market. The Congressional Research Service recently estimated the implicit expenditures in the tax code for energy specific provisions. It found that the production tax credit was the most expensive at a projected cost of $25.7 billion from 2016 through 2020. The second most expensive provision was the related investment tax credit, also designed for renewable energy sources at a cost of $13.6 billion. These two provisions alone accounted for almost 48 percent of the total energy tax advantages analyzed in this particular report. By artificially encouraging the expansion of wind and solar capacity, current tax policy makes energy production less efficient. Now some have argued that wind and solar are infant industries that need support from the tax code. But these arguments have been around for decades. At this point, wind and solar are not infants, they're grown adults. If they can currently only serve niche markets, that's the economic reality. It's also worth addressing the distributional consequences of some of these particular tax measures. So for example, a 2015 study by UC Berkeley found that for the particular measures trying to reward consumers for buying electric vehicles, 90% of the credits went to filers earning above $75,000 per year and 35% of this particular tax credit was claimed by people earning above $200,000 per year. A more consistent, neutral tax code would let producers and consumers choose the mix of energy sources that made the most economic sense. Energy would be produced at the lowest cost, freeing up resources to increase output in other areas of the economy, giving Americans more reliable energy and a higher standard of living. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you.
Now, a number of witnesses today have, have said that in recent years, renewable energy sources are getting the lion's share of tax expenditures. So let me ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Murphy. Um, your testimony claims this amounts to artificial encouragement for the renewable energy sector, which I find interesting given that our country has been providing different types of artificial encouragement for fossil fuels since before you and I were born a long time ago in my case. <laughs> Dr. Murphy, yes or no, do you believe that the PTC provides artificial encouragement to the wind sector? Yes, I do think the PTC provides artificial encouragement, and th that's why I focus, I think, the negative wholesale electricity prices that wind operators are offering is a clear signal that, that that's not a normal market outcome. Okay, so then it may be just yes or no because we're running out of okay. time. Do you consider percentage depletion an artificial encouragement to the oil sector? Um, I, I think it's, I would agree with what uh, Mr. Zeiger was saying, that it, it's it perhaps an artificial um, tax code treatment, but I don't, I don't know what the, if the rationale was to encourage output. All right, what about intangible drilling costs? Um, ag again, it's, it, it may be in incorrect tax policy, but I, I don't know that it was what the, what the rationale was for that. I'm going to ask, I guess, Dr. Murphy, um, Is there any country in the world that has a better, more diversified energy production market than the United States? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, not to mine either. We're number three in oil production, could be number one. We're number one in coal production, number one in natural gas production, number one in hydro production. I think we're number two in ethanol. I believe Brazil's ahead of us in that. I don't know where we are in the solar industry, but we'd be in the top five, and I believe we're number one in wind production. That's not bad. So um, is, is there anybody on the panel that disagrees with the statement that, or let me rephrase it, is there anyone on the panel that thinks we would be better off if we went from a free market capitalistic energy sector to a government-owned, government-controlled energy sector. So if, if I could just make one comment on that related to the earlier question, too, that, yes, all of the above from the Institute for Energy Research perspective means that a level playing field and let the market determine the outcome, so not favoring fossil fuels, not, not favoring renewables, just let markets, uh, uh, consumers and producers choose the right mix. Right. Well, and so... Uh, Dr. Murphy, I'd like to get back to a question you said, uh, or you, you put in your in your paper, uh, and that was about um, how wind can actually bid into the market, into the PJM, uh, when they go to market on, on p getting power uh, at a virtually a negative, a negative rate and still can make money on that because of the subsidy. Is that, um, um, is, is that? For, could you explain on an elementary level how, how you can actually bid in negatively or almost at, at no at cost and still make money with it? Sure, yes. Um, so I, sh I should mention that th there are cases where that might actually be a sense of, like, if, if a nuclear plant doesn't want to completely shut down. So it's not that this is only possibly due to this one factor, but I think if you look at the data, the frequency with which these negative wholesale prices – so, yes, they're, they're legitimately negative prices where – producers of electricity are paying people to take their product from them. And so I think a main reason that we've seen the prevalence of this increase is the production tax credit. So you're an operator. You, if you own one of these things, for every megawatt hour that you sell, your tax bill goes down $23. And so as, lo as long as the marginal cost of production aren't that high, you would be willing to even sell at a negative price because all things equal to you individually, you make money doing that because it, not, it reduces your tax bill. Okay, and just in the closing, let me just make sure I understand, uh, Dr. Murphy, your uh, statement you make in your um, in your written testimony, and you may have made it in verbal. I might have missed that, but there was talking about the federal federal support uh, for the uh, uh, wind and solar. Now is is in the particularly in solar. Uh, let's just focus on solar. Is is somewhere I believe you listed is two hundred and thirty one dollars a megawatt, uh, and coal is at uh, fifty seven cents. Is, am I reading your, your, your statement correctly? Yeah, well, what that was, yeah, that was from the written testimony, and that was for looking at fiscal year 2013 EIA had 
looked at the total federal support, so that included direct grants, not just tax preferences, and then we adjusted it for a per megawatt hour basis. Okay. So given the difference between $231 and 57 cents, how can anyone in good conscience say that we are trying to not pick winners and losers here in Room, Washington? Well, right, I agree with you, um, and I also think like some of the other comments made reflect that, that talking about how historically there hasn't been much support for wind and solar, and right, and that's why we haven't seen any real generation from wind until very recently. So I think that underscores the point that what we the, the expansion of wind thus far is driven by the, the tax code and, and other mandates. It just, I know I'm over our time, but just would you agree that that would provide, if we were to become more reliant on wind and solar, that we would have an, uh, an unreliable grid? I think so. Just obvious common sense that wind is intermittent. So even in areas where it does make economic sense, you wouldn't want to have a whole grid dependent just on that because sometimes the wind's not blowing. This is for everyone on the panel. Why would we have decided that tax policy is the best means for advancing policy initiatives? Do you want to just go down the? <laughs> yes, if I understand your answer, I, I would say it, it, it isn't. That I, I think that tax policy, if the government needs to spend funds, then yes, they have to have taxes to get them, but that they should try to do so without, by distorting what would otherwise happen in a market outcome as little as possible. Uh, Dr. Murphy, uh, where are the greatest inefficiencies in our energy markets? Is there anything that we've not talked about here this morning that you'd like to highlight? Well, I, I think that you, uh, we've discussed in general all of these aspects um, that in particular, yes, I would just say that I would caution policymakers as regarding things like the social cost of carbon that even stipulating the, the physical and science and chemistry and so on, it's not an, ob an obvious exercise to go from that to this is the dollar figure that we should then implement into policy. So just to, to motivate that, if you asked 100 physicists how hot is the surface of the sun, they're all going to give you an answer that's pretty close. You ask 100 economists what's the social cost of carbon, the answer is going to be all over the place. Well, and in terms of the temperature of the sun, it's not, uh, as long as you're close, it's not going to matter that much. Right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, Mr. Murphy, um, what components, I guess, continue on from that, what components uh, of the tax code work best for electric and gas companies and their customers, which is important? Well, sure. So, yeah, just to, to follow on, um, I think I'm coming from a slightly different angle. My position on this matter, so, yes, economists, when they, they're they concerned that right now the income tax, corporate income tax, by allowing the deductibility of interest payments of a company raises money by issuing bonds, then they can write that expense off, but not if they issue stock. Um, and so I'll, my point is simply, though, if you, if you got rid of that deductibility but kept it as an income tax, then that means the companies that have a lower net income are getting taxed at a higher rate if they happen to have be capital intensive. So, so yes, it's things like utilities that are very capital intensive, what seems to be an arcane matter of tax policy could have a huge impact. And as Dr. Zeiger was saying, it might get passed on more to consumers because of the way that their prices are set through rate making and they show their costs. Um, so I, I would just caution that if there is going to be tax reform, but it's going to still be an income tax to make sure a company is being taxed on its genuine income.